Hello and welcome to The Kamla Show. We bring you interviews and conversations with newsmakers, filmmakers, technologists and entrepreneurs from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. On today's show, we are talking politics and my guest is Ro Khanna. He's running for the 17th district, that is the 17th congressional district in Silicon Valley. You're running for Congress. I am. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I've heard a lot of great things about the show. I'm looking forward to being on. Thank you. You're on. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad. So, Ro Khanna, what is your full name? Rohit Khanna. Ro, Ro is a nickname. Uh, I've used it since junior high. Junior high. Yes. Okay. So, District 17 is a new district, and we have a map of the district. And just in case you can take a shot of that. And uh, District 17 is a new congressional district here in the Bay Area. And the current rep is Mike Honda, who has been elected seven times and is going to be standing for election for the eighth time next year. Correct. And he's a Democrat. Correct. You are a Democrat. Correct. What made you run, uh, what made you, uh, what inspired you to run for this congressional district? I've been a longtime resident of Fremont. And when Fremont was drawn into this new district, the heart of Silicon Valley with Apple, Intel, Yahoo, Cisco, the heart of innovation, and the only Asian majority district in the continental United States, I thought that my background as a uh, teacher at Stanford and Santa Clara, as someone who has written on economics and innovation, was uniquely suited to represent this district. And Washington seems broken. Uh, no sense of an economic strategy, no sense of what we need to do to prepare people for the 21st century. And I wanted to take new ideas to Washington and really represent Silicon Valley. It almost sounds like uh, President Obama's uh, refrain when he first ran for election, was, Washington is broken. But Washington has been broken for many years now. Well, it seems like it keeps getting worse. Uh, and it, it's probably more broken now than ever. Congress's approval ratings are the lowest they've ever been. And it's because, partly because of all the special interest money. I mean, you have a situation where most of these members are uh, beholden to PACs, to lobbyists. Uh, we've taken a very bold pledge in this campaign, not taking a single dollar from a federal lobbyist or a PAC. I want to ban that money, and a lot of politicians talk about banning money, but I think you have to practice what you preach. And so we're saying absolutely no contributions, and I think that will allow me uh, to be independent, to compromise, uh, to actually get something done for the people of this district. So you're raising money from individuals. Exactly. Many of them are wealthy individuals. Yes, sure. Some, of, some are, some aren't. We have uh, support from some wealthy uh, in, in, uh, individuals, entrepreneurs, innovators. We have support from working families. We have a support from cross-section of Asian Americans. We have support from educators. Uh, I'm very proud of the broad spectrum of support. But the critical point is none of it comes with strings attached. And so I can go to Congress and advocate for policies on education, on economics, that will actually help create middle class jobs and be uh, representative of the district. So why is it when we read about you in the media and when they talk about people that are supporting, they usually talk about people like Mark Benioff of Salesforce, Sheryl Sandberg of uh, Facebook, right. Marissa Meyer of uh, uh, you know, Yahoo, but uh, not of uh, other companies that are in your district because uh, Facebook technically is not in your district. It's not. Well, I'm very honored by the names you mentioned to have their support. Uh, our support is broad-based, but the reason the press focuses on that is those folks t t to not have gotten engaged in congressional politics. And so it's extraordinary that we are mobilizing, among other people, the innovators and technology leaders because they love our vision of taking special interest money out of politics, of focusing on innovation, on focusing on how we're going to prepare people to be engineers and computer scientists. And so it's really mobilized uh, people who haven't been engaged before at a congressional level. And that's why I think there's been a lot of press attention to that. So w let's go back to what you said. This is the first Asian American district, congressional district in the continental USA. Correct. And it has a majority for the first time, probably, you know, you have a majority of Asian Americans. And the incumbent is an Asian American, Mike Honda. Correct. And um, I, I don't know if it's the first time ever, but it's the only one right now in the continental United States. I'm I believe uh, because uh, yeah. one of the professors in Santa Clara University okay, said that this was probably the first time. Right. Uh, that because this is a new district. It is a new district. That was yes. uh, announced in 2012. Yes. 
Uh, and you mentioned Silicon Valley, but technically Fremont and Milpitas, do they fall under Silicon Valley? Sure, yeah, I, I definitely think Fremont with Tesla, with, uh, uh, and Milpitas has Cisco in it. Uh, they very much see themselves as part of Silicon Valley. Of course, the, one of the issues uh, that I've been campaigning on is bringing more technology to our schools. We have technology poor schools in one of the most technology, technologically rich areas in the country. And so we need to have higher speed internet into our schools. We need to have the Khan Academy and access to that massive open online courses being used in our schools. So there is definitely a sense that some of the areas aren't uh, as equipped in education as they should be. But I definitely think the region more broadly is part of Silicon Valley. So talk to us a little bit about your vision. What, uh, what is the vision that you have and how are you different from uh, uh, Senator Mike Honda, uh, Congressman Mike Honda? Well, the first uh, is a vision of reform, uh, getting, as I said, the special interest money out of politics. Uh, the second is a real vision for uh, education. How are we going to get more young women into uh, engineering and entrepreneurship? Uh, only one in seven engineers are women right now. We need specialized uh, attention when women are uh, girls are between seventh and ninth grade to teach is them. Is that true of this demographic also, one in seven? Yes. In fact, it's true of Silicon Valley. Only 3% of startups in Silicon Valley that get seed funding have all women entrepreneurs. We have to do a better job uh, of preparing our young girls to have an interest in coding, to have an interest in entrepreneurship. And that's been a huge focus of mine. And I've also focused on what are, what are we going to do to have more women uh, succeed at the top levels in these companies? How do we have the right type of parental leave? How do we have uh, the right type of incentives for companies to hire qualified women and make sure that they reach the top rank and have childcare and a balance uh, at these areas. And so uh, they're one of the, the places where we've really had a strong agenda is having women in technology. Another uh, place uh, is what is our strategy to be competitive in a global economy? We're part of a global economy and our companies are moving to Ireland, they're moving to Singapore, uh, and jobs are going offshore. And my, my question is, what is anyone doing about it? Congress seems asleep at the switch. So what are the nuts and bolts of your plan for making this region competitive? And two is you mentioned jobs uh, moving offshore. Right. But part of your key demographics I are Indian Americans right. and uh, Chinese Americans. You know. Sure. Uh, well, they have kids too who they need have jobs. Kids, <laughs> they have kids, but uh, so uh, so uh, that impacts in some ways the immigration. Uh, you know, uh, you're hitting home close the when you say outsourcing jobs. But let's just talk about uh, the nuts and bolts of your plan to make this region competitive. Right. And that this question comes from a uh, viewer. Absolutely. Well, first is education. We need to be teaching people the skills they're going to need to have jobs that I have called for teaching programming from fourth grade onwards as compulsory so that young kids grow up with, the, uh, un with an understanding of technology. We need to have more entrepreneurship classes. Uh, the jobs in, in, in the next generation, people aren't going to have the same job for 30 years. They're going to have to go from one job to another. They need to have an understanding of entrepreneurship. We need to have uh, people who are going to go into advanced manufacturing trained in robotics and CNC machines, understand, uh, have a pathway in community colleges to prepare people for real skills that are going to lead to employment. So we have a very robust uh, education agenda. We have a, uh, an agenda on economics to help startups. Uh, I have called for a tax credit for pe entrepreneurs uh, for the filing fee of incorporation. These people are often maxing out their credit cards and no one is really trying to make life simpler for them. I've called for using technology to simplify the regulations and the paperwork that entrepreneurs have to, to face. And we have a whole agenda uh, for, for startups and entrepreneurs. There's an entrepreneur that I know who has been flirting with the idea of starting a company, but he doesn't know if he wants to start in California because he says that the tax and the incentives to do business here are not conducive for him. Right. So uh, it looks like there is more tax that uh, entrepreneurs have to pay if you have a startup. Well, there's there's there there's huge regulatory burdens of paperwork. And no one is talking about lowering the environmental standards or lowering uh, safety standards. But we have to make life simpler for them. Uh, we have we can use technology to have a one-stop shop so that over ten days they can fill out most of the paperwork. So to you're start talking the Delaware model. 
Uh, Delaware has, uh, I don't think Delaware has fully Im even implemented it. I think Silicon Valley can lead the way in using technology to make uh, government more efficient. Uh, we can also have the right type of incentives, expand the research and development tax credit to startups that aren't yet profitable. Make sure that uh, they're able to raise capital and that the SEC uh, interprets the Job Act in a way that they can go for crowdsourcing. These are the issues that entrepreneurs face every day. And Congress people, not only aren't they listening, they can't even speak the language often. They can't even debate coherently or understand what these policies are. And it's time for a generation that understands the technology and economic issues that face Silicon Valley so we can be competitive in the 21st century. But uh, you have never held an elected uh, office. So True. what would it, uh, how would you be well qualified to address some of these questions that you talk about the Congress being broken? Well, I think some of the people I talk to like that the best about me, that I haven't been corrupted or part of the system yet. But I have had a valuable experience. And I served the president, as you know, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce uh, in the executive branch. And uh, that will give me a very unique skill going to Congress, having served in the executive branch and understanding the agency. So that for this region, if we have to apply for grants at the Department of Energy or Department of Transportation, uh, I will be one of the few members of Congress from this area that has actually served in the executive branch and can navigate that bureaucracy for both entrepreneurs and for citizens who have issues with the agencies. And most people, their uh, requests are of agencies, not of Congress. Uh, and so I actually think that will make me very effective for the area. Where did you grow up? I grew up, uh, I was born in Philadelphia and grew up right outside Philadelphia in a suburb uh, of Philadelphia. And that's where you went to school? I went to public school there, Council Rock High School. And, and your mom was a substitute teacher? She's a substitute, she was, she's retired now. She was a substitute uh, school teacher. And what did your dad do? He's a chemical engineer, he's also retired and he worked uh, as a chemical engineer for 30 years for the same company. And so what was the conversation around election time at your home when you were growing up? Because it looks like you became politically aware very young. It was, it was not uh, as much about uh, electoral politics, but I do remember we would all have dinner together. We'd watch the evening news back then. Uh, everyone sort of watched the evening news. And who would, did you watch, Peter Jennings or uh, Tom uh, Brokaw? Uh, we, we probably, I don't remember who my parents' favorite was, but we watched uh, both. And uh, the, the conversation would be more about issues, about uh, human rights, about uh, w foreign policy, about economic policy. And it really didn't get into the nuts and bolts of the process, uh, nor did I contemplate, frankly, back then running for office. But I definitely had a sense that I would want to write on issues, that I'd want to speak out on issues, uh, that I want to be engaged in the public debate. Were you in your school's uh, debate team or? I was, I did, I did debate in, in high school. I was, uh, I wrote a lot of letters to the editor uh, in, uh, uh, for the local paper, I would go to school board meetings to speak out about some of the funding cuts that they were having for arts programs or music programs. So I was active as an engaged uh, citizen. And, uh, and, and, and I really believe that's the highest privilege in American society is not sort of holding office. It's just the virtue of being a citizen, uh, you can have an impact. And then you went to University of Chicago to do economics. Right. You didn't follow your dad's footsteps and go into engineering. Right. No, I, I had an interest in, in, in ec economics and understanding uh, what uh, we needed to do to, to, to grow the economy here in the United States and around the world and uh, had a great uh, education at Chicago. And you did something very interesting in Chicago. You did two things. One is you organized some kind of a seminar, I believe. Oh, well, you've done your research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you did. Uh, we, organized, we organized a conference on modern democracy that brought together uh, academics and politicians and leaders and we had the Prime Minister of uh, uh, Canada, or the former Prime Minister and President of Haiti. You know, an interesting uh, anecdote, we were inviting famous people from around the world and of course uh, one person who would have attended and we never even thought to invite uh, was our current President, Barack Obama. He was a relatively unknown state senator uh, but uh, I also had the opportunity uh, to work on his very first campaign back then and people say, did you know he was going to be president? I said, I would have invited him to the conference <laughs> if I knew that. But uh, I did think he would be a charismatic uh, leader uh, in his community. So you didn't invite him or you invited him? We did not. We didn't. I mean, he was, he was on no one's radar back in 1998 uh, in 
terms of talking about democracy and the challenges for democracy uh, being uh, a, a involving citizen participation. But that uh, conference was all about how do we get citizens more engaged in democracy at a time where decision making is more complex. And it's been a common theme uh, for the last 15 years of my life. How do we get citizens more engaged? And now I think Silicon Valley can provide that platform to improve citizen participation. And the second thing is you met with uh, President Obama when he was uh, a senator, I mean a state senator in uh, Illinois. I worked on his very first campaign. I didn't do much. I don't want to overstate the relationship, but I uh, worked, I knocked on a couple precincts. A guy named Will, Will Burns was my uh, boss at uh, Blue Gargoyle. He's now an alderman in Chicago. And with him, I knocked on a few precincts for uh, then State Senator Barack Obama when he was running to becoming a, uh, to become a state senator. And then what prompted you to do law at Yale? Why did you, did you want to do law? I did. I always had a fascination with law as something that uh, could uh, create uh, a fairer, more just society. Uh, Yale has a, a wonderful reputation of thinking about law broader than just uh, the black letter law, but some of the philosophical questions uh, facing our country, our society. And so that's why I chose to go to law school there. And you specialized in uh, IP, intellectual property. Well, the general, you have a general education of, of law. And then, of course, I decided to come to Silicon Valley because I thought the most cutting edge of law was around technology. It was the, a part of law that had not been developed. And I became a uh, intellectual property lawyer at O'Malvaney and Myers, a, a law firm in uh, California. And then you went and uh, spent two years under President Obama, uh, you know, as uh, the in the Commerce Department. Right. And then you came back and you taught at Stanford and Santa Clara. But during all this time in 2004, I believe you flirted, or was it 2000, or was it 1990? When did you first flirt with the idea of running for elections here in California? Well, in 2004, uh, I was uh, 27 years old. I was opposed to the war in Iraq and opposed to some of the provisions of the Patriot Act that were infringing our civil liberties. And so I ran a three-month effort uh, against a member of Congress who had voted for the war in Iraq. Republican. Uh, a, Democrat a Democrat who had Democrat. voted for the war in Iraq and voted uh, for the Patriot Act. And I knew I had no chance of winning, but I wanted to uh, stand up for the principles uh, of civil liberties and a fairer foreign policy. And I'm very, very proud of that effort. So that was not a serious effort? In, in well, it was very serious in the issues we took. And I, it was one of the first anti-Iraq war candidacies in the country. Well before President Obama ran uh, for president, we were, I was out there uh, as a congressional candidate saying that the war in Iraq was wrong, and this was bef before Bush's popularity sag. So it was a very, very serious campaign on the issues, but it was a three-month effort and not a serious campaign in terms of winning. I mean, I knew, uh, I was self-aware enough to know that I wasn't going to win that race. And then uh, a couple of years ago, you, uh, you again thought of running for Congress from District, what is now District 15, where Pete Stark was the incumbent then? Well, we had thought of, I had moved back home and thought of running for Congress from a Fremont-based district. And we opened an exploratory committee and we uh, kept our options open of where in Fremont uh, to, to, to run. And when I uh, got a chance to settle back and really think of where I could best serve, uh, it seemed that this district, which had the bulk of Fremont, uh, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara, Cupertino, uh, and the heart of Silicon Valley would be where my skills would be best uh, best uh, put to use. And so that's why we announced for the for District 17 as opposed to District 15. But did you think of, uh, because you raised money two years ago, and that's why you made a lot of news that you raised over a million. Was it over a million? We raised over a million this time, and we had raised over, over a million last time. And last time we certainly had considered exploring the option of where best to serve. And Fremont, it was a confusing time because Fremont was just going through redistricting. We didn't know how the lines were all going to shake out. And so we wanted to be prepared and then to assess where uh, from Fremont would be the best district be to serve. And that, uh, after a number of years, I decided to, to run here. But we always kept our options open. That's why we can use that money to run here. Otherwise, uh, you would have to specify it to a district. So one of the user, uh, viewers wanted to know, why have you raised so much money? You have raised how much so far? Well, we've, we've raised uh, a, a little over two million, but you need four or five million to, to win these congressional races. I think Ami Berra, who uh, won, raised four, four million. You, you need 
this is we're not raising something extraordinary we're raising what it takes to get the message out but traditionally that's not the amount of money that's been spent in these areas has Actually, it? it is i think the, the congressional race like i said ami barrow ran for congress that's up in sacramento in well, this, this is even a more expensive media market the reason we haven't had those type of expenditures is because we have people holding these seats for 15 20 years like uh, and people want change and there just haven't been competitive elections one of the things that we're doing, which is bringing so much excitement, is for the first time we're giving people in the Bay Area a choice to say, let's have a competitive election. But competitive elections uh, cost uh, uh, millions of dollars uh, in the state of California because of how expensive media is, and that's, uh, uh, that's common. So again, you, you say competitive election. Another viewer wanted to know, why are you competing against a fellow Democrat? I, I think no person, whether they're a Democrat or Republican, is, should be immune from competition. Competition is at the hallmark of Silicon Valley. It makes us better. It makes us more innovative. And it, as Democrats, we ought to embrace competition. It, look at when Obama and Hillary Clinton ran. That made the party better. It made both candidates better. And this debate is going to be great for Silicon Valley. Let's talk about what are the right policies to get more women into science and technology. What are the right policies for us but to But what be about the young men? You know, the women is one thing, but there are a lot of young men also who need to get trained. Absolutely. We, I mean, we have a glaring uh, statistical discrepancy and that's why I keep talking about women because only one in seven are engineers but of course we need young men to also get uh, trained in computer programming to have the skills to be competitive uh, and to, to get jobs in Silicon Valley and to start companies and we need to figure out how to keep companies in the United States these are the debates we need to be having in this area and we haven't been having them and Congress uh, many of our members of Congress are not aware of the even if the issues don't have a sufficient knowledge of the issues and i want to have that conversation in this campaign and that's really uh what will uh, make this area uh better and make our representation better and what is the demographics of your district in terms in, of in terms of uh you know is it uh over 50 percent Asian American. What is uh, what is the percentage of Asian Americans? It's a little over 50 percent. It's about 51 percent Asian American. And the rest? The rest is uh, Latino, African American, Caucasian. And uh, do you have a lot of young voters in this district? First time voters? Well, we, we, we do. I mean, it's a balance. I mean, we're getting a lot of excitement. The people who are the most excited about my candidacy is actually the seniors because they see... Seniors? Yes, a lot of seniors are very excited and because they get that the future of the country matters. Seniors are the ones who think most about the future. And they get that we need a new generation of folks to come in, to care about the country, to go into public service, and that uh, there has to be a time for transition and get, letting a new generation lead. They care most about the future of this country. And they see and want to see, they're excited to see someone new come in and, uh, and speak about uh, what America needs to do in the 21st century. So this is very interesting, seniors, because you, uh, in fact, if you look at the way you're conducting elections, one of the uh, observations has been that you've borrowed a book from President Obama's election style, and in fact, you have a lot of his team members working in your team. Jeremy Bird comes to mind, who's right. dubbed as the field marshal by Rolling Stone, because he, he Does ran he get the that good press? <laughs> 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 so he uh, he runs a campaign style which is people focused, data driven right. strategies, and a digital savvy approach to the campaign. Right. And the, he approached a lot of young people, yeah, and first time voters. How is Jeremy Bird's team, 270 strategies, helping you? Well, I, I think they're what they're doing is they're building the a grassroots campaign where we're reaching not just young people, we're reaching. Uh, people of all backgrounds in their communities and talking about the issues that affect their communities. For example, our community organizing, we found out in Santa Clara, one of the biggest issues is that a library is not being able to be built. Now, most elected officials Which just, is the North Side Library. The North Side Library. Now, we were Why out, is it not being uh, It's a lot of bureaucratic uh, hassle. 90% of the funds have been spent, and yet the county is saying that they uh, aren't willing to release the the remaining funds because the RDA, the development agencies were closed. But basically a lot of bureaucratic uh, infighting and the library should be built, especially when 90... It's built. It's actually waiting yes, to be open. But, but when 90% of the funds have been spent and they need to... 99%, they need to just do the final step. We were... No pol political leader was out there. And our entire campaign team was out there because we understood 
what was most important to the community. And the biggest difference in the style and the election in this between the two candidates is one, uh, my opponent, who I respect, is really out there trying to get all the endorsements from Washington. He's get, got from President Obama. He has. We've gotten the, the team. He's gotten the, the, the incumbents. He's, get, he's focused on uh, playing traditional politics, getting the PACs, getting the uh, special interests, raise, getting the traditional endorsements. And we're focused. We believe it's a different election. I, I believe the issues that matter most are local issues. I'm focused on things like making sure the library gets built in Santa Clara, making sure that the environment is protected in Cupertino, making sure that the trash dump in Milpitas that's affecting citizens is taken care of, making sure I was out in Fremont the other day, talked to a couple who are doing a garage sale every weekend because they're having a difficult time making ends meet. I want to be helping those families. I believe a job of a congressman is to be connected locally in the community and not to be uh, just focused on national politics in Washington, D.C. That is the central difference in our philosophies in this race. So that is uh, the central difference you said. The elections take place in 2014. Right. So you tossed in your hat on uh, April 2nd, was it? April 2nd, right. And there was a Bollywood dance also at De Anza College. I saw a little YouTube video. Oh, great. Well, there was, <laughs> we had Chinese American dancers, Bollywood dancers, and uh, we, we were wanting to uh, and one of the things we're bringing in politics is the mix of co po politics with culture. And uh, I'm really proud of Anna Wu's support, who is, again, a local, uh, heads the Cupertino Performing Arts Center. And she's an engineer turned dancer and has talked about the importance of the arts. And Steve Jobs talks about the importance of arts, graphic arts classes and making him an entrepreneur. So we've taken an approach of really bringing in the culture into politics to connect with people. So the elections take place next year. Next year. And it's been uh, dubbed as jungle primary because this is the first time in California that the best two people go up right. uh, in the final race. So the primary is in June. Primary is in June. 2014. Right. And then we go to the booth in November. No, the, the go to the elections in June. In June. Yeah. Okay. So when does the best of two happen? In, 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 in June. In June. In okay. June. And then the two top two advance into November. One of the challenges for us is to make sure that people register to vote and vote in, in June. Uh, and with the Asian American community, we've seen that many of them don't go out to vote. They're registered, but they're not voting in June. And I really hope that this election, uh, whether they vote for my opponent or me, that they will take exercise the right to vote in June because that's such an uh, important part of a democracy. So what will your name be on the ballot? Rokana? It will be Rokana, yes. Okay, so thank you so much, Ro, for coming and talking to us. We have lots more to talk. Hopefully, you'll come back again. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, so Ro Khanna is running for elections. Next year is when it happens, 2014. And if, if I could just say, our website is rokhanna.com, and a lot of the information is on there. Yeah, rokhanna.com is his website, and he is busy knocking on doors, calling people on the phone, and participating in community events to have people go and vote in the upcoming elections. The elections are going to take place in 2014. And thank you for tuning in. And as always, we will be back again with another show. Until then, goodbye. So we'll